Hello, listeners. Welcome to another English language episode of Futurecast. My name is Issa Krautio. I'll be your host today. We have a great pleasure and honor to welcome retired three-star me, is three-star general uh, Ben Hodges and former commanding general of the United States Army Europe to the show. Welcome, Mr. Thank Hodges. you very much for the privilege. Uh, first of all, we have a lot to talk about, but uh, first of all, we are in many ways more immersed in the world of war through social media these days. Pictures, cameras, and phones. Do you think civilians, regular people, are more close to the reality of war than ever before these days, or are there still some blind spots and some ways in which social media distorts the reality of war? Well, I, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, people have more... Um, sense of what it looks like, the, the combat on the ground, the destruction uh, that happens, uh, particularly of cities, uh, uh, innocent people killed by Russian uh, missiles and rockets slamming into apartment buildings. Um, but I think we've become a little bit numb mm. to it uh, when you see so much destruction where it just doesn't shock. As, as much anymore as it used to. And I don't know that that's a good thing. And also, um, it could convey um, a sense of uh, um, video game when you see so much drone footage, you know, of drones flying into tank turrets or uh, buildings and, and doing all this. Um, it, 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 it's possible to draw the wrong conclusions from what is so readily available if you're if you don't have a, a broader context for it yeah i'm a, i'm ashamed to men, uh, to admit that uh, i feel that same type of numbness every now and again and my educated guess is that it's not the same type of numbness as the people who are actually serving in the front lines get well we we know we know from history that uh, images are very powerful um you know the one of the most famous uh, images from the war in Vietnam was this, uh, the young girl running down the road that um, had been burned by napalm. Um, uh, even images from the American Civil War of dead bodies on the battlefield. People had never seen that before. American soldiers killed in World War II when the first pictures came out of that. I mean, these had powerful uh, impact on how people viewed the war or what was at stake. Now you see so much death and destruction. Um, it, it's lost, unfortunately, some of that impact. And so we do become numb. And now, you know, the fact that Russia is uh, destroying Kharkiv block by block, mm. it's like it's not even news, even though this is one of the biggest cities in Ukraine. Uh, used to be 2 million people there. And there's, there's no moral outcry um, about what Russia's doing to Kharkiv. Summarily, I must say, um, there has been a significant impact in Israel, in Gaza Strip, with uh, the destruction has uh, uh, changed how many people think about that conflict, and frankly, their support for Israel has been degraded a lot because of what they see. Yeah. So speaking of Ukraine, it seems that the assessments from the ground are always sort of tempered by the expectations that we have of the situation. So just as a kind of a hypothetical question, if you if you could imagine or picture yourself being back in Feb February 2022 and experiencing the first week of the full frontal assault of Russia and Ukraine, and then if you were giving a, given a snapshot of what was going on in the war, in the front lines in, in April 2024, how do you think you would feel about the situation in April 2024 from the perspective of 2022? Sure. Uh, I, I think three things come to mind. That's another interesting question. Uh, first of all, um, I was sure that Ukrainian forces would do well because of the people, the soldiers that I knew, I was sure that, the, you know, they would not be overrun in three days. That was ridiculous. Um, but I also thought the Russians would do much better. I, I grossly overestimated Russia's military capability. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, those, those were from the first days, uh, my estimate of how both sides would, would do. Uh, the second 
sort of thing is that um i uh i have i'm very disappointed that uh my government has failed to um here we are in april of 24 more than 10 years it, since the war started and more than two years since the beginning of the um, uh, large-scale military operation, large-scale invasion, um, we still have not clearly identified the objectives and of what, why this matters. Uh, and that failure to uh, identify the objective and, and the strategic end state that we want has resulted in terrible policy or no policy of uh, hesitancy where the focus is on avoiding escalation to a nuclear conflict versus helping Ukraine win and delivering what's needed to help Ukraine win. So that's, um, you know, as I look at where we are today and because the administration, um, who has done a good job on many other aspects of this, but because they have failed to make the case of why it's important, they left the door open for uh, Trump and his supporters to stop aid for Ukraine. They, mm. They've been able to change the narrative from one of helping Ukraine defeat Russia to, um, you know, what about our own borders? And so that, that's, that's something that I, I would not have anticipated. And then the third thing is uh, the emergence of France as a, uh, as a powerful voice, uh, the emergence of Finland as a, a powerful uh, voice and contributor um, and uh, the resolve of particularly Central and Eastern European countries because they know, you know, what the, what the outcome is if Ukraine is defeated uh, or Russia feels like they can keep going. Mm. So that, that, those are not necessarily all related, but those are the three big things that come to mind um, now that we, after hearing your question. Yeah. Speaking of that, I, I was going to actually ask you this later, but since you now mentioned it, different governments, different intelligence agencies, different, uh, I guess, people, commentators have given different timetables and, and timelines for a another assault or maybe like an maybe an assault on a nato country by russia the number of three years to five years has been given some governments are unwilling to give an assessment of any timetable and some people are saying that there's no Im immediate risk of of this in the sh in the near future how do you see this situation well uh you know when somebody says three to five years i mean that's a huge span of time yeah i mean that's a you know, cover all your uh, <laughs> cover all your bases on your prediction. <clears throat> I think that the time it would be based on two or three things. Number one, the the technical logistical side of things is uh, professional estimates by different people, different intelligence services on how long it would take Russia to recover from the shellacking they have taken at the hands of Ukraine to rebuild their forces. Uh, and and uh, build up the necessary logistics to take the next step, which would be uh, a conflict with a NATO country, and presumably with with NATO. I mean, that's we're not talking about a little sliver of Lithuania here. We're talking about you know if there are they pre really prepared to uh, have a conflict with a with NATO, uh, and they would have to uh, be thinking that the entire alliance would respond. Hmm. So, you know, the, the timeline is based on when will they be ready from a military and economic standpoint. And uh, they, they have enormous damage to repair, enormous losses to fill. And I'm not so uh, sure that they can actually do that um, or that Russian people would be up for that. But that's that that timeline is it's not unreasonable but but i think that's what it would it would be based on that sort of calculation and uh it's not a perfect science obviously because there will be a lot of other factors how much help would russia be getting from iran or china and so on and this this goes to a larger question about strategic uh design that i'll that i'd like to come back to now uh, the other factor, of course, on whether or not um, Russia decides to make the terrible calculation that they could launch some sort of attack against NATO 
that would not be a big giant uh, red arrow going all the way across Europe the way it would have been during the Cold War, but instead something designed to break NATO, to, to challenge us to attack a NATO country and then stop and say, do you really want to have a nuclear war over Latvia or Romania or, or something like that? Um, and I think they would do that if they felt confident that either number one, the United States, uh, was not willing to, to engage in that or would, had turned its back on Europe, so to speak, or that if other countries in the Alliance were not willing to do that, because if, if we didn't respond, if we didn't live up to our article five obligations, then they would have in effect achieved their objective of, of breaking NATO, hmm. uh, which is not to say that several countries would not respond, but the alliance. So that their their assessment of whether or not we have the cohesion and level of readiness to uh, to deal with that, mm. I think would affect their timeline also. Yeah. And what is your analysis on that? I want to package this uh, point in a larger question about what the Northern European security situation looks like right now with the accession of Sweden and Finland into NATO. How does the Baltic Sea look like as a as a potential um, area of conflict at this point? How, how have the power balances shifted after the accession of Sweden and Finland? But also, do you think if there is a... Um, I don't know what it would look like. Let's say a, a small kinetic operation somewhere in the north of Finland, the border of Finland and Norway, maybe spurred on by even some Chinese pressure or, or something like that. Who knows? Uh, do you think there's enough interest in Spain, Portugal, Southern Europe, let alone the United States, to actually activate Article 5 and, and make sure that uh, the union, the promise of the alliance holds? Well, uh, okay, you really are good. <laughs> um, <laughs> first of all, NATO got better the minute that Finland joined and then Sweden joined. I mean, th these are net pluses in terms of capability, uh, string, uh, geographic uh, advantage now for the alliance. Um, over the both in the high north, but also over the Baltic Sea, um, both countries bringing very good um, modern high tech defense industry, and both nations bringing fit, resilient societies. So, uh, no downsides for NATO in the addition of Finland and Sweden. Uh, and I'm not throwing bouquets here. I mean, that's you know, when I think about my experience with officers and soldiers and sailors and airmen from both Finland and Sweden, it's only positive experiences uh, and with the quality of what they, what they bring in, in their societies. Um, Thank you. Then, I want to say. <laughs> well, it's, it's sincere. Um, I've got good friends, uh, former army chiefs from both countries that I, with whom I dealt a lot over the last few years. And these are really quality people. Um, the, uh, the, the key to deterrence is the adversary or potential adversary believing that you have capability to cause them enormous harm or cause them to fail, and also believing that you have the willingness to use that capability. So that's, that's going to be the key. Uh, and obviously, American uh, leadership and participation in all of this is going to be an essential component, not only because of the nuclear deterrent, but because of the, the mass, the the scale of what the U.S. could bring if it were committed, both economically as well as militarily. So um, the the scenario you, you pose, something happening in the in the Arctic region, um, I think U.S. Canadian um, thinking about this would be very important to how the alliance would respond. My sense is that yes, of course. Um, the United States would respond to that for multiple reasons, not just because of its uh, Article 5 obligation. But you do highlight uh, a reminder that Article 5 is not automatic. It is ultimately a political decision. Um, it's not like a laser beam when you when you walk through a door or walk towards a door at a store and the door automatically opens up because you broke the laser beam, right? That's, yeah. that's not Article 5. 
um, it has it is a political decision by all the nations that yes, this constitutes an Article Five uh, situation which means an armed attack on one is considered an armed attack on all. And then the nations respond in accordance with, you know, what they're, what they're willing to do and, and what the, uh, regional defense plans require them to do. Um, I think that the, uh, likelihood that we would all respond is very high. Now, you know, what would be required? What's the appropriate plan? So th this is why I think one of the most important things that came out of the Vilnius summit last summer was the approval by the North Atlantic Council of uh, the plans, regional defense plans, or what, what NATO calls the family of plans for the defense of NATO's eastern flank. And they're, they're regional plans, as you probably know. Uh, these still need further maturation and um, training but nonetheless, these are specific plans, and nations are obligated to make contributions to those plans. So there may not be a requirement for a lot of Portuguese or Spanish troops to be involved in a plan in the, in the high north. But you could imagine Spanish Air Force um, or intelligence or other capabilities that might be a part of NATO's response. This will be the calculation that the Russians and perhaps the Chinese are making when they think about you know, what do we, what do they want to accomplish? Yeah. You've given some really, really good interviews about the situation in Ukraine. For example, for, for Jake Bro, you did one recently and then, uh, for Silicon Curtain, uh, which went really viral. It's at almost 600,000 views at this point. And, um, the title was very, very interesting and, and, uh, and, I don't want to say sensationalist, but uh, the siege of Crimea has started, something like that. Very interesting. It's kind of surprising for a lot of people following the course of the war, thinking that uh, Ukraine is in for a couple of, or, or, or I mean, difficult months ahead. Uh, it was actually Jonathan Fink's phrasing, not yours, but you agreed right. with it. So, <laughs> so I, uh, I want to, uh, I want to ask about that. What does that mean? What? What is the siege of Crimea, and why do you think it has started? So, um, thanks for asking that. Um, and I did get some uh, hate mail on uh, on Twitter, like, you know, it's siege of Crimea. I mean, what are you talking about? You know, I, um, first of all, the, the overall narrative is so negative about what's happening in Ukraine, and it and the reality is so far from that. I mean, it's it's very difficult, obviously, for Ukrainian ground forces uh, since they have been denied uh, adequate support by the United States thus far. And not all European countries have stepped up with as much as they could or should do. Um, so, uh, you know, they they had to pull out of Abdivka after months um, because of a lack of artillery ammunition, not because of a lack of drones. Um, so there, there is an impact, but to put that in context, um, I think that actually Russia is in big trouble. Uh, this war has been going on for more than 10 years. Russia had every advantage, um, and still they occupy less than 20% of Ukraine, and, and they don't have the ability to knock out Ukraine, to knock Ukraine out of the war. Um, the Russian Air Force has failed to achieve its two most important tasks, which is number one, to uh, achieve air uh, superiority and they and number two which is to be able to interdict the lines of communication the, the convoys and trains coming from poland into ukraine bringing stuff they, they haven't destroyed a single convoy or train that's incredible hmm. uh, the black sea fleet's troubles are well documented by now about a third of it's underwater they're having to pull out of sevastopol to some extent because of just a few storm shadow and scout cruise missiles that were employed by ukrainians so I think um, it's it's useful to keep in mind that uh, there's a lot of doomers out there, which is exactly what the Kremlin wants, is to create this. It's inevitable. There's no way Ukraine can win. It's just a matter of time so that they'll get um, people to say, come on, we just need, we need to end this war. We need to uh, put pressure on Ukraine to give up territory for the sake of peace. Why should we provide more stuff they're going to lose anyway? No, it, no, they're not. 
Um, but that that's a narrative that's out there that, and I'm, I'm glad you're giving me a chance to push back on that narrative. Now, the siege of Crimea, I think uh, that uh, came about because I do believe that Crimea is the decisive terrain of this war. I don't think Putin really cares that much about the Donbass, except that it provides a, a land link to Crimea. Crimea is the great prize because of what it offers in terms of uh, a seaport, a navy base like Sevastopol, um, as well as our projection platform for Russian air power and cruise missiles and all that, not only into Ukraine, but frankly, they can cover about 96, 97 percent of the Black Sea with uh, missiles launched from Crimea. They can they can disrupt or prevent freedom of navigation. Uh, a lot of energy and a lot of food supplies move through the Black Sea. So Crimea gives them that, which is why Catherine the Great took it the first time back at the end of the 18th century to protect Russian ports from, from the Ottoman Navy. Um, so uh, it, that's why it's important to Russia, but it has not always been Russian. That's the narrative they would like. Mm. Uh, and and uh, unfortunately, even candidate. Trump has, has bought into this. And, and so you saw the article, I'm sure, in Washington Post a couple of days ago. He's got a plan that he can end the war in 24 hours. And what it yeah. basically means is telling Ukraine, stop, give up any hope of Crimea, give up the Donbass, and then, then the war is over. But that's incredibly naive and strategically illiterate to think that Russia would stop, that all they really wanted was Crimea. The other side of that, of course, is... Uh, any hope of reconstruction of uh, of Ukraine after the war is is really going to be handicapped if Russia controls Crimea because Crimea blocks access into Azov Sea, where two of Ukraine's five biggest ports, Mariupol and Berdansk, even if they were rebuilt, would be useless for Ukraine because Russia controls Azov Sea and they have the capability to disrupt traffic in and out of Odessa, Kherson, or Mykolaiv. So that's why I believe that Crimea is the decisive terrain of the war. Hmm. When we say it's under siege, um, what does that mean? Not in the traditional sense with trenches all around the Crimea, you know, and then and, and it's blockaded. But the fact is the, Ru the Russian Navy is having to withdraw from Sevastopol because uh, Ukraine demonstrated with special forces, uh, maritime drones, uh, aerial drones and storm shadow and scale that the Russian Black Sea fleet is completely vulnerable sitting there with just a few weapons um, and that other uh, air bases and other facilities in Crimea are vulnerable to these kinds of strikes. And, and so what uh, Ukraine is doing is by number one, destroying these uh, LSTs, landing ship tank, which are the large Russian Navy ships. Uh, they're not warships per se, but they're used for carrying armored vehicles. That's also useful for logistics, for carrying stuff. Hmm. So once the Kerch Bridge is destroyed, and it will be, um, without having these LSTs available, Crimea becomes increasingly isolated. And that's that's the key to making Crimea untenable is by isolating it from outside reinforcement and then by uh, through the use of long-range precision weapons and drones destroying the facilities there. This is this is what's underway. I could not tell you when Kerch Bridge will mm -hmm. be dropped, um, but I am fairly certain that General Budanov and the others um, have uh, several... Um, I don't want to say ideas because it's more than that, but it'll be done in a way um, that is effective and will will surprise us as well as the Russians, which is what they've been doing for the last two years anyway. I mean, they continue to surprise us. Yeah. Even if you did know, I don't think you would tell it here on the show. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, I've read that um, there's been... 
there have been some worries about uh, Ukraine, Ukrainians. Not, I don't want to say reluctance because I don't know if that's what it is, but their inability uh, to construct defensive lines, defensive positions, similar to the ones that Rus Russia built with the Surovikin line. Uh, and just a very general one-on-one -on -one basics question about defensive lines. What are defensive lines? What are effective and ineffective defensive lines? Why are they important? And how should armies think about constructed defensive lines, especially Ukraine and the situation they're in right now? Yeah, this is a, another good question. Of course, these are uh, manpower intensive, uh, intensive in terms of engineering equipment, um, or they they need depth. It's not like one long line of trenches that's kilometers deep. If if you're intending to stop uh, attacks, um, you need landmines, all of these things. So um, I don't know what all the the thinking is on the Ukrainian side. Um, I think that they're they have probably uh, are doing some things around Kharkiv to uh, to make sure they don't lose. Uh, Kharkiv, um, but you know when when you're when you're hard pressed for um, for cap for assets, you have to prioritize. Um, I'm not so sure that as they look at what Russia has, that defensive lines are necessarily certainly not from to cover the entire width from top to bottom of you of the country. That that's what's necessary hmm. um it, that would be useful in some places to 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 provide uh anchors around which ukrainian defenders can uh hold out against uh these human mass assaults um and the amount of bombardment that russians are launching as part of every attack but um i just don't see large armored formations that are well-trained, properly supported, and logistically enabled that could exploit any kind of a breakthrough. I mean, Abdivka, that happened back at the end of February. Hmm. So almost two months down the road, they have still, Russians have still not been able to exploit it because they don't have the capability. So I, I imagine that that's part of the calculation that goes into Ukrainian decision-making on where and how much should they invest into fortified lines? There could also be a political calculation that they don't want to uh, create something that becomes a hardened border in a negotiated thing. Right. I don't know that, but that 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 could be part of the calculation. Uh, I see occasionally people talk about the Dnipro River. Is you know that's I think that would be a horrible idea. To say, you know, let Russia have everything east of Dnipro, that that would be, uh, I think, a catastrophe for not only would it be political suicide for any Ukrainian leader to agree to something like that, but also to give Russia that much of eastern Ukraine uh, from from an economic standpoint, agricultural standpoint, population, nothing good will happen to Ukrainians on that east side of the river. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, do you think there could be like a psychological effect? If we build a defensive line here, it sort of draws an, uh, an unofficial border that then de facto might become the border around which the negotiations would uh, would start to happen. Well, certainly that's what happened in uh, Korea, yeah. uh, in the Korean War. I mean, uh, once the war of maneuver had ended, then it became a matter of lines and there was an enormous fighting to advance the line during negotiations a few miles, you know, North or South, and um, I, I don't know that. That's that's one hundred percent speculation on my part. But it's kind of like the first thing that I thought of on your yeah. question is hardening that line of contact. And you know, the um, when you're trying to achieve a decisive outcome, you don't achieve a decisive outcome through defense. You know, and I think the the outcome for Ukraine has to be, and it should be for all of us that they eject Russia back to the 1991 border. Mm. And so um, to reestablish the sovereignty of Ukraine. And, and I think that must be part of the calculation. But there is, from an operational level of war, 
uh, there's advantage in having places where you can anchor strong defenses while you conduct maneuver warfare elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think, uh, General Sierski, he probably spends a little time every single day, you know, reviewing plans. Where do they want to invest, uh, resources? Uh, um, how would they do that? I just don't know what that is. Yeah. I know you like talking about a proactive Western strategy that we should have one, we should construct one. There should even be a discussion, a more open discussion about one. But uh, so I want to give you an opportunity to uh, to tell how you're thinking about that has evolved in the in the recent months. Where do you see both? I guess it's it's two pronged this question. What do you think a proactive Western strategy could be? And then also, is there enough political capital and uh, unity within the Western alliance to sustain the kind of strategy you would like to see? Well, you know, um, the, the kind of the simplistic uh, concept of strategy is ends, ways, and means. The ends are what are you trying to accomplish, the ways are the how, and the means are the resources required. And so, obviously, the step one is identifying the end. What, what do you want to accomplish? Uh, that's been our biggest failure, I think, thus far in the West, is to clearly identify the end. So you get ridiculous statements like, we're with you for as long as it takes. Well, first of all, the Ukrainians don't believe that anymore either. But that's not an end. And that's not something that's compelling to American voters and taxpayers or German voters and taxpayers either. Well, why, you know, we should be devoting, uh, pouring so much resources, so many resources into helping Ukraine win. Um, I, I think clearly identifying that it's in our strategic interest, not because we love Ukrainians and we're inspired by their courage or don't like what Russia is doing to them. It's because it's in our strategic interest that Russia is defeated. That once Russia is finally defeated the old fashioned way, then, uh, we have an opportunity to fix European security for generations. Uh, but as long as Russia believes that they still are for this empire, and they were, they're going to keep doing what they're doing now. And, um, where, you know, when Putin dies and he will die, so fact, somebody else like him will come along. So mm -hmm. the only way to cause Russia to reconsider who and what they are and to, uh, free Russian people, uh, from the yoke of Russian empire, which has taken many different forms over the centuries, um, is for them to be crushed. Um, as, as my friend Gary Kasparov, I, I own the part of his team at Renew Democracy Initiative, and I was with him last week in New York, and, and he, he uses the phrase, Ukrainian victory equals freedom for Russians, which is really uh, interesting. Of course, he's a Russian dissident, uh, uh, is that Russian people um, will never be able to change who and what they are until that notion of empire is is once and once and for all destroyed and that uh, Russia has undergone uh, some uh, significant changes after they lose a war uh, and I think there's too much uh, hand wringing that goes on in Washington and Berlin and probably some other western capitals that uh, somehow uh, it's a bad thing that the Kremlin falls, that, that Russia's defeated, that it will unleash incredible nuclear escalations or chaos everywhere. And I don't, I don't think that's the case. I'm not advocating for regime change, so that should be our objective, but obviously we should plan for that. Um, uh, what, what are the implications and consequences? Um, 19, uh, December, 1941, Japan, uh, bombed Pearl Harbor, brought the United States into the war. Uh, January 1942, Churchill comes to Washington from what was called the Arcadia Conference. He actually came at the end of December 41, stayed over at the White House for Christmas, and they had what was called the Arcadia Conference. And during that conference, while U.S. Navy ships are still burning in Pearl Harbor, uh, and despite the fact that most Americans did not want to get involved in a European land war, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt recognized and agreed on a policy, a strategic priority of Germany first, that Nazi Germany had to be defeated first 
before they turned their full attention to defeating the Empire of Japan. Hmm. That was an important part of strategy because it was a priority, and then it helped them organize their thinking for building industry, for growing the types of armies and navies and air forces they would need to fight a global war. And then one year later in Casa, at the Casablanca Conference, January 1943, and by the way, wherever, there's no reason for optimism here. I mean, Great Britain had suffered mostly defeats for three years. The U.S. had just lost half of its naval, its sea power, and most people did not want to get into the war. And so here's two leaders with strategic clarity talking about priorities, and then January 43, in state, unconditional surrender. Not some namby-pamby, we want to fight a, a huge war to get to a better negotiating position. No, is we're going to fucking crush Nazi Germany and the mm. Empire of Japan. That's the end state. And that's what enabled them to organize for victory. And that's what's missing right now. Um, I think we, the focus on Russia or Ukraine is all about limiting escalation. And we know from history and we know from what's happening right now, limit, focusing on limiting escalation only drags it out. It, I mean, it, it, it betrays how little we understand Russia. Mm. And then keeping that separate from what are we trying to do with Israel and Hamas, and then you've got North Korea and, and China. I think these should be linked together. And if we look to them as a global challenge, the way that Roosevelt Churchill did, that would cause us to develop strategic priorities, uh, to be more clear about it in state, and then you could have conversation with your population about why this matters. And this is what we're going to do. And I think most Americans, just like most Finns, would probably say, okay, that makes sense. But yeah. without a strategic clarity and a clearly defined end state, the, the administration is not able to make the case with their own population. Yeah. And I want to ask about that, actually, the differences between um, European and United States interest. Uh, um, in Europe, in Finland, the role of the United States, States as a security guarantor has been uh, very apparent for the past few years. But then in the United States, there seems to be this sense of um, unwillingness to be the security guarantor of the world in, all per in, in perpetuity. Um, is this just a phenomenon that exists in, in MAGA Republicans, or is it a broader sense in American society right now that uh, uh, this can't go on long term? And this, this is a failure of leaders from both parties uh, being able to explain to Americans why it is to our advantage that we are, quote, the world's policemen. Of course it's expensive, and, and of, of course— uh, the average person that lives somewhere in the middle of the United States or even on the coast, like, why are we, why is it our troops that are doing this? Uh, that is uh, ignorance. That, that, and, and it's the job of the uh, administration and the Congress to explain to populations how much America depends on freedom of navigation, for example. I mean, if you don't have the world's greatest Navy out there making sure that ships can move around the world, that, that affects us, our ability to export and import, um, mm -hmm. or for our allies to have access to energy resources, for example. So, um, it, it, you know, this is kind of a catchy phrase um, that is used by populists, uh, and it takes it, it exploits people's strategic illiteracy or lack of interest or attention or lack of understanding of geography and history, uh, because we are spoiled in the United States, having this, this incredible gift of our geography with oceans on both sides and friendly neighbors to the North and South, um, that there is a, a large part of, of American society that is isolationist. Now, why does, why does that matter to me? Without thinking about the fact that er almost everything inside their house was imported from somewhere else, um, or that uh, most American companies depend on exports to another country. That's you have to you have to have um, uh, stability and security, in, for, in order for that to work. So uh, I've, I'm sorry, that's kind of a, a rambling answer to a good question, but it it does boil down to people not appreciating or understanding why it's to our advantage 
that we are able to influence what goes on. This so-called international rules-based order that was created after the Second World War is enormous advantage to the United States and all of its friends, mm -hmm. which, of course, is why the Russians hate it, the Chinese hate it, the Iranians hate it for economic reasons. Uh, that they, and they want to turn that over, and, and we're very close to losing this enormous advantage because of our own internal domestic problems. Yeah. I don't disagree with anything you said, quite the opposite, but if I were to come one step uh, ahead to meet you in the middle or meet the perspective in the middle to sort of, to, when people say that, hey, you need to take care of your own backyard, you need to pay the 2%, whatever sound bites people have. In Finland, it seems like, um, as far as I understand from the national conversation, uh, it does resonate here that, I mean, we do want or we do recognize the need for the United States to be the security guarantor, especially today. But it's a good point. We need to take care of our backyard before we make demands. How do you think? Do you think that's the right way to think about it? Well, uh, every president since Truman, every president, Republican, Democrat, didn't matter, complained that our European allies should do more. Uh, of, of course they should. I mean, you know, uh, that, that's a common sense thing is yeah. to expect that uh, Germany, Poland, Finland, Norway, Portugal, Italy, everybody should do their part. The 2% is a metric. I don't think it's the best metric, but it was the one that everybody agreed on. Okay, well, then, then live up to what you said you would do because for sure uh, people are counting on the United States to provide this nuclear shield um, and uh, to provide... Uh, other capabilities that are out there from which almost every European country benefits. Um, and, and so, yes, uh, I think also, though, it would be helpful if most Americans appreciated that whether or not every European country does what it should, that doesn't change the fact that it's in our interest that Europe is, is stable and secure. Because America's prosperity is is tied directly to European prosperity. It's our biggest trading partner as a group. And so uh, if Europe's on fire, if it, if there's conflict there, uh, if you've got millions of refugees all over the place and, and food and energy supplies are being disrupted and freedom of navigation is being disrupted, that affects us. Yeah. So I, I think it's it's just, it's not, you're not paying your 2%, therefore F you. I mean, that's, that's not how it that's not to our advantage. Yeah. I still have a couple of questions, if that's okay. Do you mind? Okay. Yeah, okay. sure. No, I, you're, these are excellent questions. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, about U U.S. politics. Um, I remember in 2022, in the first months, people said that if there's anything that Ukraine won, it's the information war. The, I guess the, some people said the propaganda war. Ukraine uh, succeeded in mobilizing Western support and global support, uh, which is uh, which was pretty apparent back then. But uh, I don't know how um, I don't know how conclusive that victory was. If you look at uh, how polarizing the question of Russia and, and support for Ukraine is right now, especially it seems in the United States, you even hear people answer questions: Who do you prefer, Joe Biden or Vladimir Putin? You hear people say Putin. Uh, I don't know what the percentages are, but how, as as a as an American, how do you see how did this happen? How how is this possible? And what is your best sort of good faith steel man version of how, what goes through a person's mind when they say that they prefer Putin over Biden? Well, um, I, first of all, I, it's hard to even imagine that that an American would say that, especially from a Republican. Um, you know, you think of Ronald Reagan yeah. and who was always stood up against the evil empire, the axis of evil, and um, it was Republicans. And now you've got uh, Donald Trump publicly praising Vladimir Putin as a great man. He's really smart uh, in the same way he praises uh, Xi Jinping or Viktor Orban. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, if I didn't know it was true, I would not believe it to be true, uh, unfortunately. And so uh, American politics has, be has become, has evolved into this uh, mess where uh, 
one guy with his enablers is able to um, create a uh, belief system that is detached, I think, from reality and, and is also a huge threat to our Constitution um, as well as to our alliance. Um, now, why why is that? Why why are we so vulnerable to that? I think the Russians have invested a lot of time and effort, as have the Chinese, into undermining our society. Mm. Uh, we, uh, I think, we're we're particularly vulnerable because of uh, education standards. You know, a population that is not as uh, educated uh, and, and alert as it should be, which is embarrassing to have to admit. Um, we don't live up to our own talking points, actually. I mean, we have enjoyed this uh, the greatest country, the beacon on the hill. It's, you know, millions of people risk their life to try to get to America every year, which is true. But we, we have become, I think, so uh, egocentric and uh, have, have lowered our guard. And so uh, we become susceptible, parts of society become very susceptible to um, this sort of Russian uh, disinformation. Um, you've got religious extremists that are like Taliban. I mean, they do everything except cut people's heads off um, and their intolerance. And, and so this is where our leaders have got to uh, be, be clear. They need to say, look, we're at war with Russia. That doesn't mean that we're shooting, but the Russians are clearly at war with us. And until we wake up and realize that, we're going to continue to be infiltrated. We're going to continue to uh, um, be susceptible to further disinformation where people lose trust in their institutions. You know, the United States has always had a, a level of chaos. I mean, that's the nature of a democracy anyway, uh, and, and particularly American-style democracy. There's always this, yeah, I mean... Uh, January 6th was not the first time we had a terrible day, but I always had confidence uh, that the institutions could absorb a yeah. lot of damage and we would eventually get it right. This is the first time where I felt like some of those institutions are uh, more fragile than maybe I realized. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, on the other hand, when... You Europeans like to look at the current situation in the United States and scoff at them. I mean, it's good to remember that the United States is a much older democracy than many European democracies, and it has stood the test of time, and it's still here. But yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Are these institutions as resilient today than before with the internet, with social media, with new dividing lines in politics and society and, and, and things like that? It's a very interesting question. I think we're going to do an episode on that later, actually, in a few weeks. But... Um, Last question, and thank you so much, uh, Ben Hodges, for this episode. This has been uh, very, 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 very illuminating. Um, broadly, do you see the strategic interests of the United States and Europe converging, or what is the opposite of converging? Going the other diverging. Diverging. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, I think that um, uh, we are still converging. We've got so many shared values. Um, um, we, we need each other, yeah. actually. You know, the United States, even with the biggest defense budget in history, does not have the capacity to do everything it needs to do to protect all of its strategic interests or all of Europe's strategic interests. And, and all of our best and most reliable allies come from Europe as well as Canada and Australia. So um, I think even with the uh, increasing uh, attention towards the Indo-Pacific region, uh, the United States knows on both sides, Republicans and Democrats, that uh, it's in our strategic interest economically and from a security standpoint and diplomatically that we stay closely connected to Europe. Uh, of course, there's going to be different views on things of whether it's economic or how do you deal with Israel or, you know, countries want access to Chinese markets. Uh, America's policy cannot be, you have to buy American. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's not going to ever happen, but it's also not helpful if the French or the EU says you can only buy EU product. So yeah. I think, um, if 
finding ways to improve improve our integration uh, while uh, doing this uh, with respect um, is important. You know, NATO, uh, our alliance, is not perfect, but it's, I think everybody acknowledges it's the most successful alliance in the history of the world. And that's the reason it's grown from 12 to 32 members, and there are still countries in a queue that want to be a part of it. Nobody's knocking on the door of the Kremlin saying, please let me back in. So I, I think that um, America is going to continue uh, being a uh, uh, focused on our relationship with our European allies and our economic partners. Um, but also keep in mind a little bit of history. America was primarily oriented on the Pacific before the First World War. I mean, our... Uh, most of America at the time were people who had immigrated from Europe trying to get away from European wars and uh, are from religious persecution or, or looking for economic opportunity. You know, my family is predominantly uh, Scots-Irish. Uh, I would like to claim that I had a royal background, but actually they mostly were released from debtor prison to come, you know, uh, in the early days in the colonies in the southern United States, what became the southern United States. So it's this pivot to the Pacific is not a new thing. It was Pacific oriented from before the first world war, but it was a requirement to come back to Europe in the first world war against most Americans not wanting to do it. Mm. And then we didn't want to do it in the thirties, but then we had to come back again, uh, for the second world war. And that's when the focus became, you know, with NATO and a, a European focus, because we didn't want to have to come back to Europe for a third time for a, a land war. Yeah. Um, the United States has about a hundred thousand military personnel in Europe. Now think about that a hundred thousand. That's about what fills up Wembley stadium in London. That's crazy. Okay. Today, a hundred thousand. Yeah. That's, wow. but that's one stadium. So people talk about this huge American commitment to Europe. It's Wembley stadium yeah. worth of truth. That's, and half of that is rotational. They don't, they're not there permanently. They, come and go after three months, six months, nine months, that sort of thing. Uh, the U.S. Navy uh, in Europe is the part that's permanently assigned here is uh, less than probably what Finland and Sweden have total uh, in terms of number of capital ships. So it's, um, it's not a huge commitment that we have, but it is a commitment that's very important for us as well as or Europe. And look, I want to say, I, um, I believe in, in my country. Uh, I, there are way more good people than there are uh, knuckleheads. And um, uh, we know that d democracy is, is not a ballet. It's more like rugby football. And uh, it is hard. And so the things that protect it are uh, media, people that shine the light on stuff, that hold politicians accountable, that hold businesses accountable. Um, and, uh, and young people coming out to vote. Uh, if young people turn out to vote on November the 5th, we will not have to worry about Donald J. Trump anymore. But if young people don't show up because they don't understand or they don't care or whatever, or they don't have confidence in the system, then we will have another Donald J. Trump administration. So that, that's what's at stake here. Mm. I do need to let you go soon, but, um, you're okay with it. If... Donald Trump is elected. What advice do you have for Europe? Well, um, you know, you can't say you're for democracy, but then hate it when you exactly. don't like the outcome. Yeah, so, that's true. Uh, if 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 the American people actually elect him, that that he is the president, and in all that all that comes with it. Uh, but I hope that uh, uh, our institutions are strong enough to resist. You know, the court system, the 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 media. The Congress, um, I mean, there, there will be a lot of pressure on our, on our institution. We already know that. Trump has said that, that the people that are, will enable him if he's elected again uh, have made it clear what they want to do. Uh, so our European uh, allies, uh, I think, I, I know that uh, leaders from Europe, many European countries are already speaking to the Trump campaign, as they should, you know, so that you can understand Okay, what what does that mean for my country or for Europe if there's a Trump administration? You would 
I mean, that would be the strategic thing to do to at least have your eyes open about the possibility. Um, but I think that, uh, um, look, the, the combined economies and, and power of Europe is equal to or, or say, supersedes the United States. So Europeans, if you know, you can sit at home and complain about Trump or you can get off your butt and uh, come together and, and exert pressure in the different ways uh, that you can. Yeah. Okay. This is enough. I've stolen enough extra minutes of your valuable time, Ben. Thank you so much for, uh, for giving me this interview. Well, I, I really do uh, appreciate the privilege and opportunity you gave me. As it, thanks for this. Thank you so much. And thank you to our listeners and viewers. Uh, I'll see you next week with a new episode. It's probably not going to be English, but we're going to come out with another English language interview uh, shortly. So we'll see you then. Bye-bye.